Good afternoon and welcome back. As I said earlier in the morning, I wanted to briefly discuss the topic of efficiency of our programs. It is actually important in real life and I will explain with some examples what could happen if we are not careful with our programs. But essentially to our first year students, we should tell them at an early stage that efficiency matters and the program execution time, in spite of the fact that the computers are very fast, program execution time remains a parameter of importance and it should have a bearing whenever we are designing algorithms. So essentially we are going to discuss efficiency of our programs and we are going to discuss the notion of time complexity. We will take an example of estimating value of pi and in the lab today afternoon you will actually repeat the similar kind of uh, counting of execution uh, times uh, for the Fibonacci series. Uh, the, uh, the assignment has already been mailed and I think it is on Moodle. I acknowledge of course some slides uh, courtesy my colleague uh, Professor Melin Soni who had actually when he taught CS101 he had introduced uh, the computation of pi or estimation of the value of pi in his course. I have taken the basic theme and extended it uh, to suit the purpose of illustrating the notion of time complexity or illustrating the notion of efficiency of our programs. First of all, some comments on the computational time. So we observe that while the computer works very fast, it does take a finite amount of time to execute any instruction. So by every computation there is some time. At one time this time used to be in seconds, it then became milliseconds, it then became microseconds. And now there are machines which can execute instructions in few nanoseconds. But still there is non-zero finite time required to execute any instruction. The challenge is that if we are not careful in designing our program, we may actually force the computer to unnecessarily execute instructions without adding value to our final solution. And that is what we are trying to look at. So when we say that we want to design efficient algorithms, what we mean is we want to achieve the same results, but we want to see whether by writing programs in some particular fashion or by taking care of some costly operations and replacing them by less costly operations and this will naturally happen in case we have iterative solutions, which is what is true in most of the real life problems that we encounter. Very roughly, the order of magnitude of time which is required to execute any program is called time complexity. We will actually introduce the notion of order of complexity towards the end in a very simple fashion, which is what I would like you to look at. But the important message that we want to convey to our students is that they should design their algorithms, the steps in their program such that the ex execution time of the program is minimized. So we start with an example illustration. This example is estimating the value of pi. As you know, pi is related to any circular shape. In particular, the area of a circle is given in terms of pi. Pi r square is the area. However, if I consider a unit disk, that means the disk where the radius is 1, then naturally the area is exactly same as pi. We observe that the area of the circle, if it is pi, then the area of a quarter circle, which is shown here with a shaded region, it is pi by 4. Why we are looking at quarter circle? We can of course look at the full circle, but it is a symmetric thing four quarter circles are symmetric, their areas are same. So if we can estimate something about a quarter circle, it will apply to the other parts of the circle as well. That is common sense and oxymoron. Now what we do is, we have shown here a rectangle which is drawn on the two radii, they are 90 degrees apart. So what I have is actually a square. This square 
since the disc is a unit disc, this square also is one unit square. So, the length is one and height is one, one by one square. And of course, I have a circle inside it, a quarter circle whose radius is also one. How do I estimate the area of this circle? If I could estimate the area, I could relate it to pi. The way I estimate it is that I take this rectangular portion, I assume this is x axis and this is y axis. So, on this x axis and y axis, I put up a series of points, number of points here and number of points here. Assume that I put n points in x direction and n in y direction or a grid. So, I will have n into n points across this. I have tried to show this through this diagram here. So, I have effectively discretized this area which falls within this square. You will notice that if I have equidistant points, then some of the points will be outside the circle and some of the points will be inside the circle. If I have very large number of points, then the total number of points denote the are, are, are representative of the area of the square. Whereas, the points, the count of points which lie within this circle would represent the area of this quarter circle. This makes estimation of this area easy because with this discretization, if I take each point, notice that this length is 1. So, if I have divided this length into n points, then each point is 1 by n away from each every other point. So, consequently the x coordinate of first point will be let us say for i equal to 0, it will be 0, it will be 1 by n, 2 by n, 3 by n, 4 by n. Similarly, y coordinate will be 0 by n, 1 by n, 2 by n, etcetera, etcetera. In short, the coordinates of any point i, j are nothing but i by n and j by n. All that I want to do is count those points which fall within the circle. Given, so how, how could I do it? I think you can form an idea very clearly in your mind. I have n square points. I will go through, go over each of those n square points. For every point, I will examine whether the point is inside the circle or outside the circle. The trick is how do I determine whether a point is inside the circle or outside the circle? Very simple. Notice that the distance from origin to any point on this arc is exactly one unit because that is the radius of the circle. Further, for any point, okay, if I draw a triangle from that point on x axis, let us say, then I can calculate the value of the length of the longer side. What is that? This square plus this square. So, essentially, for any coordinate i and j, i square plus j square is equal to the square of this length. Now, the square of the length for a point which is exactly on this circle, you will notice that the property there will be that i square plus j square will be exactly equal to n square. Sorry, if it is less than n square, the point is inside the circle, if not it is outside. This count divided by n square is obviously pi by 4, which is the area of this quarter circle. Armed with this information, I can now estimate the value of pi by just putting up a count which goes over all the points here. If I get this point, I can determine whether this point is outside the circle. If I if I am looking at this point, I can determine this point is inside the circle. I will just go over 3 n square points and I will get my estimate. The program is actually quite simple. Let us look at the program. Of course, since I am using C out and C in as I told you, I am using namespace std and IO stream, but in a regular C program, I will replace it as we already know by saying hash include std IO dot h and I will have either uh, scanf or printf statements to be used which we will introduce uh, uh, subsequently in the next week, after which we will have programs containing this. Incidentally, the program that has been sent to you for the lab assignment, uh, my colleague Nagesh Karmari has converted that program from C++ to C and we use those hash defines to simplify input output statements. Continuing with the estimation of pi, notice that I have n 
I have some count which is the count of points which are inside the circle and I have variables i and j. I collect the value of n. So, that means I have so many points n by n. The estimation is actually a doubly nested iteration. What do I have to do? I have to go over all n square points. What is the easiest way of doing that? I start an iteration with i equal to 1 and let it go through n. So, that means every statement inside it will be executed n times. More important, I will take all values from 1 to n. Effectively, I am covering all points on the x axis. That is, all points whose x coordinate is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n. Within that, I start another iteration for j, where I vary j from 1 to n again. So, I am ensuring that for every value of i, j takes a value from 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n. Since it happens for every value of i, the totality covers all the points of my hypothetical digitization of the quarter circle. Once I come inside this, I will come inside the nested iteration with one specific value of i and j, whatever it could be. So, whatever is that value, I now need to determine whether i square plus j square is less than or equal to n square or not. What is the property? If i square plus j square is equal to n square, the point is exactly on the boundary of the circle. If i square plus j square is less than n square, the point is inside the circle otherwise it is outside. So, I will look at i square plus j square and compare it with n square. If this condition is true, I know the point is inside the circle, I will simply increment a count. I have started with count equal to 0. When I complete this nested iteration, whatever value of n I have given, I will get a count which is representative of the area of the quarter circle. Since I know the area of the quarter circle is 4 pi, I can estimate pi as equal to 4 into count divided by n square, because we assumed a unit disk there for the area to be pi by 4. And I will just print pi out. So, the program itself is an extremely simple program. Let us very quickly go over it again. I want to estimate pi, I define i, j, n and count, I read a value of n. What should be n? 2, 4, 200, 2000. 20,000, 2 million. Again, I take you back to our discussion on numerical computation. <coughs> As I vary n, I will get closer to the truth because the true value of pi because my points will be very close on the grid. If n is very small, my pi estimation will be rather less accurate. If n is very large, my estimation will be accurate. Although we are discussing the algorithmic efficiency, it is important to understand that my first target is to ensure that I get the correct value of pi, because ultimately the computations are done to get correct results. Anyway, going over to this program once again very quickly, I am setting up a double iteration and nested iteration in which I make the variable i go over all the values from 1 to n. For each such value of i, I make another variable j go over from 1 to n ensuring that every possible i j pair between 0 to n gets examined. And what examination do I do? I simply check if i square into j plus j square is less than or equal to n square or not. If it is, as I said, the point is within the circle, I increment my count. Otherwise, I will forget it, simply go to the next value of j and so on. Finally, when I come out, I will calculate pi as 4 times the count divided by n square, which will be my estimate of pi. So, a very simple program. Notice that most of the computations are being done here. What is the kind of computation? I am multiplying i by itself, I am multiplying j by itself, I am multiplying n by itself. So, pretty heavy three multiplications. And each of these multiplication is being carried out inside an estate group. So, these multiplications that will be carried out will be n square times 3. There is an addition here and there is of course, one comparison. And if comparison succeeds, there is an increment to the count. So, here is a quiz that I have. We will have enough time. Uh, let me let me shut this quiz because some of you would be eagerly reading this, although it does not matter. 
but based on whatever we have discussed that's why i deliberately went over the simple program rather carefully and i again point out to you that most of the computations are being done here i square plus j square less than equal to n square i increase the count the first option the effect will be negligible because we have declared pi as float actually the effect should be negligible but it is not because we have declared pi as float because pi is only the recipient of final value and that is expected to be float so we have to worry about what could happen inside the expression the b option says very large because the division operation in the final formula count by n square is of type integer divided by integer well yes it is integer divided by integer but please read the full expression the expression on the right hand side says 4.0 multiplied by count divided by n square you will recall that when we discussed the precedence we said that multiplication and division are at the same precedence followed by addition and subtraction and operators at the same precedence are evaluated from left to right consequently this multiplication and this division and uh, are at the same uh, 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 what should I say? Precedence level. Of course, the brackets override the precedence, so n square will be calculated separately. So consider what will happen now. N square will be calculated, and n square will be an integer value. Count, of course, is an integer value. However, 4.0 is floating point, and the expression will be evaluated by our Dumbo computer strictly left to right. Therefore, when it attempts to multiply 4.0 by count, by the laws of the programming language it is count which will be converted into a floating point before the multiplication is done and the result will be a floating point result once i have a floating point result it is the floating point result which is being divided by an integer number again this integer will be converted to a float so you will see that this result will still be a float and there is no problem because there is an integer divided by integer c answer would be correct answer on some machines because the values of some terms may be beyond the limits of integer and that is not necessarily at this point in time if n square is beyond limits that's it but i into j uh, sorry i square and j square which you are computing could also be beyond limits in any case we modify this program and i call it program version 1 all that i have done is i have converted integer i j n n to float i j n n and why did i do that as i admitted to you because the behavior of this program is found to be different on different machines i realized that i have to admit i do not know i cannot guess what will be the effect so to be prudent and to be on the safer side i simply replace the integer definition by float after all i am doing computations for getting a real value and there is no harm if all participating variables also store a real value please note that i might lose a little bit of precision but i will not lose the magnitude in fact i am making count as long count to ensure that count also contains the proper value of n square all by the way depends upon the value of n if my value of n that i give is 100 i will have no problem whatsoever if the value of n i give is let's say 1 million million obviously i'll have all kinds of problem so one has to be careful about taking a call on what could be the problem area anyway so rest of the program is same as i said it is still doing the computation as i mentioned and i now know that this program should work reasonably correctly i compile this program and execute it. these are the execution results i have shown i have used c++ instead of cc merely because i am using c in and c out if uh, the, the third version of this program which we shall discuss shortly has been mailed to you as part of the assignment you can download it edit it bring it back to the first version if you want and test things for yourself so you when you compile this program please note i am using minus o pi that means the name of my program is now pi so instead of saying dot slash a dot out i am saying dot slash pi it will execute the compiled and executable version that was created here called pi when i execute it because of my input output statements 
the program will ask for the value of n. Let us say I give a value 1000. With the value 1000, I get value of pi from this program as 3.13755. This is not very accurate as far as pi is concerned, but I know I seem to be getting there. I increase the number n from 1000 to 10,000. When I increased it 10 times, the value is 3.14119. You can see that I am inching closer towards the correct value of pi. I may still not be happy, so I will execute this program with still larger value and larger value and so on. I can execute it till the limits of the representation strike in, but now I can believe that before that I will probably get the right answer. Now I talk about determining computational efficiency. Let me go back to this slide for a moment and tell you what we have achieved here. We have confirmed that our program seems to work correctly. We have executed that program for n equal to 1000, we have got some value. We executed the program for n equal to 10,000, we have got some value. And we now know that if we increase n beyond this, we will get probably a better and better value closer to pi. Now we come back to the original question which we started discussing in this session. How long will it take to do these computations? And thereafter, is this algorithm that we have written the best algorithm that we can write? So let us examine this. First, how I determine computational efficiency? So I now wish to determine how long it takes to run the program. How do I measure the execution time? One Dumbo way is to use my watch on the wristwatch or a stop clock. So whenever I press return after typing dot slash pi, that means that program is going to be executed. I also press a button on my stop watch. And whenever I get the final result, I press it again. The difference is the total time required to execute that program. Unfortunately, when a program executes on a modern operating system, the execution time that I measure by my stopwatch is not necessarily the time that the computer spent executing the instructions of my program only. That is what I want to know. What would that stopwatch time indicate? It indicates the total time which will also include the operating system overheads. My program has an input statement. I have to type in the value of n. Suppose I take one hour to type the value of n. The total type on my stopwatch will be one hour and few seconds. Does it mean that to compute pi it takes so long? No, because the real time as calculated by my stopwatch is not good enough. What then do I need to know? I need to know the actual clock time that the program has taken, including my time, think time, let us say, while I was giving an input. But more importantly, I want the time that the computer's processor spent on executing instructions of my program. How do I find that out? There is no easy way of doing it externally. Fortunately, all operating systems have some utility programs which permit us to measure the time. So, there is some utility which internally keeps time while the operating system runs our program. Unix operating system and its variants provide a utility called time. That is the command. So, instead of saying uh, dot slash a dot out. If I say time dot slash a dot out, a dot out will not execute independently, but it will execute under the control of that timer. Timer is not causing any interference. All that it does is equivalent of pressing a button. However, I am able to measure only real time externally, whereas the computer utility, since it knows at which point in time the computer's processor is executing my program instructions, and at which point in time it is executing the overhead instructions of operating system. So, it can distinguish and discriminate between the two and collect different counts internally. And it is able to present it to me, Ke Baba, I have calculated the time taken by your program and these are the different components and this is the time taken. All operating systems indeed provide such utilities, whether it is Microsoft or HP UX or IBM AIX or any other units. This utility by the way may be good enough to give us a judgment on the execution time required by individual programs. In modern days going forward and I would like you to tell this to your students that while in this first course they might be writing small programs 100, 200, 500 lines, 
but in real life extremely complex software is being written such as for example an ERP package or a banking system when I go to withdraw 500 rupees some banks clerk enters something on the computer and depending upon how long that computer and the back end server system takes to do my transaction I will have to wait that much longer. Consequently all banks all financial institutions or for that matter all companies which deploy computerized system for running their applications of this type whether it is filling up a reservation form whether it is collecting cash from the bank or whatever they want to know what is the response time of the system and what is the throughput that I get from the system for the given load of users. How do we calculate the load? Well I will say that I have a system implemented in so many branches I have a centralized system take state bank of India state bank of India has 16,000 branches even if you forget the subsidiaries they have 10,000 branches they have almost 2 lakh employees imagine that in 10,000 branches just two people are simultaneously conducting transactions out of 20 staff members all are logged in but simultaneously only so many transactions are happening in which case there are 20,000 queries which are coming to the back end database a query is what is actually it is a parameter input to some program like our pi estimation that program will have to execute and return the results in terms of information about account balance or whatever whatever. So consequently measuring the throughput of such large and complex systems which are being used by a large number of people is an important real life requirement and simple utilities like time will not work. So there are systems which have been built merely to calculate the execution time under such circumstances. These are the two names which I have written here. One is called load runner. It's a, it's a popular uh, tool package uh, from Hewlett Packard. There is a similar equally competent utility. I call it utility but it's actually a conglomeration of large programs by IBM as well. Most popular amongst people like you and me of course is a utility which came out rather recently as compared to the other ones. It's called JMeter. It was actually designed to see the performance of uh, Java application servers or the end to end servers where the web is essential ingredient and the users are sitting across the web. So JMeter is one such thing. I am merely mentioning these details as a matter of interest. We are not going to use these, I mean our students are not going to use this but they will find this interesting. Particularly in the context of what we are going to observe now as execution times. We will all be convinced that yes, for any program that we write which requires heavy computation, we should certainly once in a while apply the time command and see what happens, how long the program takes. So as for now, we will just use the notion of the time command under whose control we would like to run our program. This is the way we measure execution time. So observe that ordinarily I would have said dot slash pi to execute my program. Instead, I use this command and say time followed by dot slash pi. All that it means in plain English is that look Mr. Computer run this program, but run this program under the control of time utility. So at the end you not only give me my results, but you also tell me some different statistics of time taken for executing different components related to my program. This is what it does. So let us look at this for n equal to 1000 I give a value 1000 the computer says value of pi is 3.14119 this is actually the output from my program and my program will end when my program ends this time utility will now print these statistics the statistics uses some very peculiar wordings it says real 0 minute 3.690 seconds it says user 0 minute 1.076 seconds and it says sys, it, may, it says 0 minutes 0 0.012 seconds. What do these different values signify? We have three of them. So just remember real, user and sys. Let us understand what the real user and sys mean to us. First of all, real time means the total clock time which the program took to execute from start to finish. Roughly then, the real time is equivalent to a stopwatch time that I would have measured if I had done the process that I mentioned to you that when I press return on my keyboard to run that uh, pi program 
I will also press a, 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 a button on my stop and whenever I get the result I will press the button again. So, whatever time duration I get that is real time in the sense that that is what the time shown by my clock or my watch and therefore, real time means the total clock time is the program took. Okay. This includes the time spent by us in giving input value. So, this um, uh, clock uh, that is why the uh, either the uh, stopwatch idea or looking at the real time alone will not tell us really how much time my program took to run. This is where the two other times user time and sys time are important independent time counts. Sys incidentally stands for system. The best way to explain this is that we go back and look at or re recall the discussion that we had in the morning. We were executing a function. We were doing some computations which were not only desired, but we had implemented it by instructions in our program. But we know that whenever a computer moves from one program to a function or something else etcetera, etcetera, there are some overheads. Essentially the time which was spent in executing operating systems instructions or the instructions of something other than my program that is given by sys. So, we have on one side the clock time, we have on other side the system time, the user time is actually the computing time taken by the computer to execute our program. Consequently, amongst all these three times uh, uh, which are displayed to us by the time command, the value which is most important and pertinent to us and which can be considered to be reflective or representative of the execution time of our program is the user time. So, this is just an explanation user time is actually the computing time taken by the computer to execute the program whereas, sys time is the time which was spent by the supervising operating system. Real time we have already seen is the total time it will also include time taken by me for input or whatever whatever. So, we conclude that the time complexity of our algorithm or the efficiency of our algorithm is actually captured or measured only by the user time. Consequently, when we run the command pi for different values of n, we, we have seen already 10,000 and 20,000. If additionally, we also issue the time command and under control of time command execute our programs, then I will not only get my results, but I will also see this usage statistics. This is exactly what I have done on the version of the program for estimating pi that we have seen. I execute this with the time command now. So, let us see what happens for 1000 I get 0 minute 0 0 0 second. Basically, since I get only in seconds or milliseconds and for 1000 it takes trivially less time to finish the computations I do not even see the reflection of computation time here. Incidentally, the real time says 2.496 seconds and most of this time probably the machine was waiting for me to give input or whatever it is. But now look at the execution with 10,000 as the value of n. The command is same time dot slash pi. So, the time will initiate the process called pi it will say go ahead and execute it. I will monitor your time and whenever you finish off let me know I will stop counting and tell my masters this is the time it required to execute the probe. Notice that or close to 0 value for n equal to 10,000 the user time is 0 minute 1.076 seconds. So, this is actually the time which is required to estimate the value of pi provided uh, my n is 10,000 that means, so many points I have digitized. Please note that the value that I am getting is 3.14119 I am still not comfortable with it. So, I will run the uh, program once again maybe with 20,000. Now, I can see something at n equal to 20,000 user time is 0 minute 4.3 seconds. So, suddenly it has shot up if you look at go to the previous slide the value for n equal to 10,000 was 1 minute 7 seconds and the value for 20,000 is 4 minutes 30 seconds. Very clearly the time is not increasing linearly. Okay. So, 10,000 to 20,000 is twice as much but the time required to execute is not just twice as much is more than twice. I continue this experimentation and I let us say arbitrarily run this program for n equal to 50,000. If I do that 
the value of pi that program returns is 3.14151, pretty close. I know the real value of pi I, as all of you, and therefore we know that we are reaching closer. But look at the time, the real time is 29.742 seconds, 29 minutes 0.742 seconds and the user time is 26 minutes 0.714 seconds. So, if you forget all other things with 10,000 it took just about a second or so to get me the result for execution of my program. For 20,000 it took 4 seconds, 4.304 four second and for 50,000 it took 26.714 seconds. It is very obvious that the number is not increasing linearly, but increasing very rapidly and non-linear. Is it possible to further reduce the execution time? Come back to the main theme of the second session, which is that I should be able to write the most efficient code for my program. I have written this program, it is running, it is giving results. Can I make it better? Can I make it more efficient? Well, we go through the code again and we make these observations. The first observation is that the major computation is happening during evaluation of if statement. We have already seen that, where we are saying i square plus j square should be less than n square and increment count if that condition is met. Now, this computation is done within a nested iteration, each running n times, so n square times. And we notice that why the values of i and j are changing every time value of n is fixed. Now, we notice. So, if n is fixed value, why am I calculating n square again and again and again? Is that essential? Let us go back to the program and just check it once. i square plus j square less than equal to n square, count is equal to count plus 1. This whole statement, the if statement is executed n square times and therefore, this computation is also executed n square times. The point which I am trying to make is that if n is well known at the time of entry itself, then n square can be computed once for all and kept in a variable. Wherever I require n square, I will use that variable, but that way I should in theory avoid a very large number of multiplications that will occur for every possible pair of values of i and j. This is the modification that I can think of. How did I arrive at this modification? First, I looked at the execution time, then I found out that execution times are rather high for my comfort. I am now looking for reducing them. I know where I am doing the computations, I have already identified that this is the line. Then I read the program carefully and I see whether is there anything which is fixed or constant. I notice that i is changing, j is changing, but n is not changing. Okay, so, here is the modified program version 1 or for version 2. What I am doing? This is the only line I have added here, rest of it is same. What is the line I have added? I am saying integer n 2 is equal to n square. That means, n square computation I am taking out of the loop. Now, look at the iteration for i equal to 1 to n, for j equal to 1 to n, if i square plus j square is less than equal to n 2. So, n 2 is not a computation, it is a variable fixed value and that value is fixed here at the beginning just outside the loop. So, consequently uh, you know this uh, uh, computation not just comparison between n square and i square plus j square, but the computation of n square itself which would have happened n square times because I am running the loop i equal to 1 to n and j equal to 1 to n. All that is removed that much of computation is removed and I have gone back by replacing n square by a I calculate n square once and replace it by some variable n 2. Okay. I had similar long computations for i square and j square, since they are varying I cannot do much about it, but the amount of computing time required I would think should be proportional because these are also integer multiplication that was also integer multiplication. Technically then since there are three multiplications here equally heavy and I have removed one of them, I should actually see an advantage and my program should run at most in two third time than what it did. Sadly, it does not happen. If I run this program, these are the execution results I get. Notice that I am running it for 20,000 and 50,000 now. Just to show you, let me go back a few slides where we had seen 
this for 50,000, the time it took then was 26.714 seconds. Now look at this execution, 26.898 seconds. What does it mean? No appreciable change. Well, the question is why there is no appreciable change? After all, I removed a very costly operation called multiplication from inside a doubly nested loop and pushed it outside. Here is another quiz. The execution time for each of the two versions is not appreciably different because why it is not different. So, this is an interesting quiz. I am speculating what could be the reason. A multiplication does not take very large time. It is the division operation and the addition operation which is time consuming and therefore, since my equation I will go back to the equation. This was the equation i square plus j square less than equal to n n 2 or earlier n square. This is where most of the computation was occurring. I am speculating that it is not the multiplication operation, but the division and addition operation may be taking longer because there is one addition here and therefore, that may be the problem. My speculation B or choice B, since i and j are varying, computing i square and j square each takes much longer than computing n square and that is why even if I replace n square computation by something else, it does not affect because i square and j square, i into i and j into i actually takes longer than what it takes to compute n into n. Why? Because I believe i and j are variable, they are very so therefore, somehow, somehow the computer takes longer to compute that multiplication, but n is constant, so it does the computation faster. Choice C says, our program somehow figures that n is not changing. It knows that I read the n, nowhere else I have assigned a value to n and therefore, n is not changing and thus what we did actually by saying 2 n is equal to n square and then using 2 n wherever we had used n square the computer seems to be able to do that automatically. So, it calculates n square only once and uses that value repeated. So, I am claiming that my computer is super intelligent to understand this and of course, the last choice as usual I do not know and also I cannot guess. So, this is the quiz. 